Okay, thank you all for joining the ASAP Bio preprint sprint kickoff event. Um, we will begin the recording now. So my name is Victoria from ASAP Bio and um, Jessica, next slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, over the last few years, and in particular this year in 2020, the research community has really been embracing the use of preprints, especially for the ability to have author directed rapid dissemination that could be read by everyone. So people love preprints and at, for the same reasons, the ability to have open interactions and feedback on preprints is also appreciated by many researchers, for example, you can see this tweet. And um, so despite all of these benefits um, and the availability, uh, the availability of platforms uh, to comment and curate preprints, um, curating and reviewing preprints hasn't been as prevalent as preprint posting. So we started brainstorming this event for some time and realized that perhaps a bigger challenge is how can we incentivize Victoria, you muted yourself by accident. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Now you can hear me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, next slide, Jessica. So um, this, these are the common goals of our um, of us and our organizers, which is to increase the visibility of projects for everybody who is proposing a, an intervention today, as well as having have everyone receive feedback in three rounds of 20 minute breakout sessions. So we like to take this time to hone in your ideas for encouraging review, curation, feedback on preprints. And we hope that you take this time to form new collaborations and you can incorporate the feedback you received today um, for your presentation December 3rd. Okay, so uh, next one. Okay. And uh, we have a few requests from ASAP Bio. So we hope that you keep your, uh, so we would like you to keep your microphones muted so that we have uh, no background noise. And we, we may take the action to mute everyone. <laughs> so uh, after, after the breakout session, please meet us back at the main stage. And we have some closing remarks and we're hoping to also have a group picture of everybody who is participating. And uh, we uh, want, uh, we would like everyone to follow the ASAP Bio code of conduct as well as the community guidelines that you can find that here. So specifically, please be respectful, be collegial and value and respect different viewpoints, including constructive feedback and encourage diversity. So we hope you share resources and information that are of, re of relevance, especially for the broader goal of encouraging feedback on preprints and a little bit more on the details. Um, so we have a sheet, uh, sign up sheet. So we will be sending that now in the chat where you can see um, the different breakout rooms. There are seven breakout rooms. They will be 20 minutes long each. So you can sign up your name to, um, to attend. And there will be a maximum number of participants. So to distribute people more evenly. So we hope you can do that. And um, And some more points about the presentations themselves which are coming up in the first hour. We have a strict time limit of two minutes and 30 seconds. And that's, that is to accommodate um, all 21 projects that are presenting. So please hold your questions for the breakout sessions. You can ask um, more questions there. And we will be advancing slides for uh, the speaker. So Jessica is driving the slides. So perhaps for all the speakers, so just wave, um, Jessica will be advancing the slides and I will be keeping time. And this uh, presentation is recorded and we will be posting it onto YouTube. And if there's anything you want us to not include, just let us know for the editing. And please mute yourself when you're not speaking. And in the case there's any problems um, with your slides, sorry, with um, with your uh, audio, we will come back to you at the end. And for everybody who is joining us and listening in today, we hope you listen to the specific needs in the proposals uh, in choosing which breakout session you will be attending. And the breakout room as well as the period uh, is found can be found in the last slide of each proposal. Okay, so with that, we will like to um, jump into the very first um, talk, Jessica. Okay, and that is peer review pipeline for preprint servers coming from Joe Wade. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Oh, do you mind jumping back? Sorry, I have my, everything's timed, so it's going to animate itself through the slides. It? Thank you. Okay, go ahead on to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so my idea is very simple. Uh, when an author submits a paper to a preprint server, I'm proposing that they also select the names of several possible editors. The editor who then selects the paper would handle the review process. They would identify potential peer reviewers. They would solicit those reviews and then submit those reviews back to the preprint server where they'd be posted alongside the preprint itself. And the, the authors would also have the opportunity to take those reviews if they wanted to, 
to a journal if the journal would be interested in doing that. Uh, and the whole process would be facilitated by uh, either an external website or perhaps even something built into the existing preprint servers themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So how is this different to things like review comments and PCI that already exist? Well, I think there are three really important differences. Firstly, this is entirely community driven. There are no third parties, no professional editors, the authors, the editors, the reviewers, those are all active researchers. And so this is entirely driven by people within the research community. Secondly, it's a familiar process. I think familiarity is really important and lack of familiarity is often a real barrier to adoption of these types of things. And so in this case, if you're a reviewer, you're going to receive an email um, from an editor, a name that you recognize, just as you would if you were reviewing a paper for a journal. And then finally, everything happens at the same time. I think having to do multiple things separately is also a significant barrier. But in, in what I'm proposing, everything goes through the submission process. Uh, when you submit your paper to the preprint server, all an author has to do is to identify the names of several potential editors. Um, so will this work? Oh, I think it already has, in the sense that earlier this year, my group published a paper on bioarchive. And while we didn't have an automated system to do this, we essentially went through this process, identifying an editor, the editor solicited reviews, and those reviews and our responses are now posted on the preprint server next to the paper. And I'll end this slide by saying, uh, I found that a lot of the ideas that I came up with here have of similarities to uh, the peer feedback post that's on the ASCP by website. I encourage you to click on the link that's in the slides that will take you to that. Next slide, please. So to end, what do we need? Well, very simply, we need a web-based portal to facilitate this. Uh, we need buy-in from the preprint sites. We need to be able to have the um, review process be linked through as you submit your paper to the preprint sites. And we need buy-in from journals um, to take those reviews uh, as they do already for certain review services rather than getting their own reviews. And I'll end it there, thank you. Perfect timing, thank you for that. And next we have harnessing cross-institutional journal clubs to assess and review preprints. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, um, I'm, my name is Felix. I am a PhD student in Oxford and together with Nicolas uh, Vabre, we kind of like came up with this idea of using uh, journal clubs in order to uh, look a bit closer at, um, well, reviewing preprints. Can you click to the next slide? So basically where this all comes from, please click further. It's a bit of animation. Um, where this all is coming from is actually from the COVID uh, pandemic, really, where we both um, individually at that point uh, identified in our uh, research institutes that um, we can actually use our journal clubs very efficiently to kind of like um, screen and review a, a large chunk of sort of like preprints that is out there on different types of preprint servers, especially since it was an over flooding um, of information at this particular point of time. Please click to the next slide. Um, and so for us, really, we want to kind of like, our goal is to use the omnipresence of uh, journal clubs at different research institutes in order to promote uh, the reviewing and also the training opportunities for early career researchers. And we both have made this experience that in collaboration with such as established publishers, such as uh, Nature Reviews Immunology, that we can really make a, an, an impact. So please click to the next slide. Um, when we now to speak more uh, practically, we're gonna have a first step, please click. Um, where we have a screening process in which basically the top uh, uh, the presenters are picking several top candidates of preprints that, that they can write uh, reviews on and give this feedback directly back to preprint platforms. Next, click please. Um, we have uh, the joint journal club sessions in which the best pick of the presenter will be presented to um, basically in this case our collaborating institute as well and we can have a broader discussion and really take in sort of like uh, different expertises and kind of like look at this paper from different sides. Next, please. Um, we um, then gonna go and have the best picks, which we then can also, in order to increase sort of like the awareness about upcoming trends, uh, be able to highlight, for instance, in established journals, such as the collaborations we have currently ongoing with Nature Reviews Immunology, but also uh, with, for instance, our initiatives website. And lastly, um, uh, please click. Um, this can be really then also used as a blueprint for other journals clubs to encourage them to kind of like have these cross institutional um, collaborations. And when we close this now with the last slide, please click. Um, then we uh, have a couple of things that we need for the success. A, we need to kind of like find uh, good ways to screen for uh, preprints um, pre in our subject area, which is very important. 
Um, we want to establish more collaborations with uh, um, um, publishers as well in order to kind of like get these trends out. Um, and naturally we need the support from the research community, particularly the faculty. And lastly, I wanna just say, naturally a costing factor comes into this. And in particular for us important is the training for um, early career researchers on how to critically assess uh, scientific preprints. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, so next we have IO the Academy Port Portable Tokens for Open Peer Review from Phil Cohen and Micah Altman. Phil, I think you're muted. Oh, I'm a muted. Yep, good, yeah, thank you, got it. Um, thanks very much for uh, inviting us. Thanks, Jessica and Victoria. Um, I, the, I owe the Academy Portable Tokens for Open Peer Review. Next slide. The problem we have is that reviewers want to do reviews, but they don't really want to work for Elsevier and other um, publishers who are not mission compatible with them. Um, and then we have open science projects of various kinds that need reviewers to do, for example, new peer review models and so on. And then we have authors who might want to participate in uh, open science, open review projects and so on, but they also want their work to actually be seriously reviewed and they're um, leery about submitting it to something that's brand new or startup or uh, something that seems informal or that's not going to actually advance their careers. Um, at the same time, the, at the meta level, what we need is to collect data on all these interventions that we have um, and allow people to do experiments and then analyze that so we can actually learn from uh, what we're doing in a systematic way. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide. So um, the, what we have in mind is a, 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 um, a, a backup one. Backup one, up one slide. Previous slide, thank you. So what we have is a system where reviewers submit tokens. So they decide they wanna do a review, but they don't wanna do it for Elsevier. So they chip in a token to this bank, essentially, which, and that token includes metadata about them, their fields of interest and what they're willing to review and what they're willing to participate in, maybe in terms of experiments or whatever. Then open science projects that wanna do um, new kinds of, uh, no problem, Jessica. Then, we, then there are people who want to do um, uh, new projects and they need reviewers to get their project off the ground so they can apply to the administrators of the bank and say, I need 100 tokens of people who are willing to review in a certain field. Um, uh, then they can publicize the list of people who've um, uh, volunteered to who've contributed tokens and say, we've got a new project, a new journal, a new mode of doing uh, uh, this research, uh, of doing peer review, and look at all the great people who are willing to be part of our project. Um, uh, and then all the time we're collecting underlying data. Last slide, please. So what we need to do what we need to do is uh, write a white paper that explains um, uh, the demand and the need for this and how it's gonna work. We need to eventually develop a funding proposal. Maybe something we can do quickly is a mock-up um, that shows what it would actually look like for people submitting and using and banking tokens. And then we need to drop agreements of what the commitments actually are for people who are um, uh, participating in the system. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. You oh, yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, next we have early evidence base aggregating mining and rendering preprint reviews from Tomas Lemberger uh, of Embo. Thank you. I could read on your lips. Um, okay, thank you. So th this project um, is about uh, finding ways uh, to add more value to, to, uh, to preprints by enhancing the, the presentation and the utility of the reviews themselves. <clears throat> and we are so many uh, at the call, almost 100 people here um, today, because there are more and more services organizing peer review around preprints. Now, this content is unfortunately rather uh, disseminated, dispersed. And, and the first point is there is <clears throat> a need to aggregate this content to make it uh, easier to browse and, and to discover. Uh, so this is the, the first step. Now, the second step, which is maybe even more important, is that uh, this, the, the, the reviews that are associated with, with preprint are, are very important and, and good documents for readers. They provide context and analysis, but we do not know how readers engage with these reports. So what we propose is that we find uh, what are the features that attract readers that are useful for their uh, choice in uh, on whether they, they can read the paper, they want to read the paper, how they find them and so on. 
Um, so this, uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why we built uh, the early evidence-based platform to experiment with the display of reviews and, and try to extract those features. Uh, next uh, uh, slide. And we think that by improving the display and exploiting really the content of the reviews, um, it will add value to the preprints and it will lead to, to an increased um, author engagement. The authors, they need to know that by posting the referee preprints, and we know that by experience with review comments, that these referee preprints are more valuable, more visible, more useful than naked preprints. Uh, on the side of the readers, uh, it will also in increase engagement because it will help them to find and focus on more relevant, relevant uh, uh, um, uh, content and, and trust the preprints. So uh, these two effects, author engagement and, and, and reader engagement, will of course reinforce uh, each other. And the last slide. What we want to do is a, a collaborative effort across the, the different preprint reviewing services, maybe preprint platforms to investigate uh, through user surveys and user testing how uh, users engage with the, the, um, uh, the, the reviews and develop tools that extract these features to expose them and, and experiment with the, the impact on early evidence based on other aggregating services and of course ideally on the platform uh, themselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tomas. So next we have building capacity for preprint peer review and curation in Africa, coming from Joy Olongo. Hello, everybody. Uh, Victoria, can you see me? Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, I'll be talking on behalf of Africa Archive and TCC Africa. Uh, TCC Africa Training Center and Communication is a center that supports uh, researchers, research institutes, and governments in Africa on how to improve their research output and increase their visibility. And Africa Archive is Africa's only preprint and publishing repository. Next slide, please. The next slide, please. So, um, next slide. Right. So, what we intend to do in in how to increase, uh, to encourage preprint and peer review and curation in the continent is through our, our strengths. That is capacity building and tech development. Through capacity building, that is where we come in as a center, training center in communication. We'll be offering the research capacity support at researcher and institutional and also at governmental level, especially when it comes to supporting in, in, in levels of policy. But then at the same time, what we are trying to show is the best, best practice in peer review, how peer the various types of peer review, because that is actually a big challenge in the continent. People are still not aware of, of, of these processes. And also on tech development, what we are trying to do is that we are create, we've created in partnerships with the uh, with the uh, with we've we've created partnerships with various partners such that this this platform can also help in increasing the research visibility of the output that is coming out of the continent. So we're in partnership with Figshare, Science Open, PubPub, Zenodo, OSF, and OSF as well. So what needs to be done is also help in expertise in, the, in increasing the digital workflows in the low connectivity settings within the continent as well. Next slide. So, our action plan is to increase preprint review and curation. How do we intend to do this? We intend to build a community of over 200 review reviewers that have signed up to our list. And this we've done in collaboration with our partners and also training in best, in best review practices according to the established standards, which, are in, which include and have an Africa-centric uh, context, which is always actually a big problem, bearing in mind the complexity of the continent, and also creating a review model to a module to allow the cohort to establish peer review workflows that are adopted within an African context from a technical and a cultural bit. When you're looking at a technical bit, we have been cognizant of the fact that it has some the continent has some challenges, especially when it comes to connectivity and also infrastructure support. So some of the regional partners, we are work regional and international partners we are working with in helping in reaching this goal of 200 mm -hmm. reviewers includes uh, the Confederation of Open Access Re uh, Repositories, Science Open, the Center for Open Science, Pre-Review, LibSense, African Journals Online, and ORCID. Okay. Next slide, please. The next slide. So what do we have? 
At the moment, what we have is our strength right now is the fact that we've managed to create partnerships that have helped in establishing uh, digital scholarly workflows within uh, the African context. So we've successfully managed to do that as I've shared in the previous slide. And through this, we want to, we have successfully managed to connect existing preprint submissions, uh, submission portals with rapid peer review workflows with our service providers. So what do we need? Uh, we need the funding to support the human resource tech development to ensure and provide for interoperability of the service providers, to expand on our existing partnerships and being cognizant of the fact that uh, some of the infrastructural capacity supports and the internet connectivity in the region is a bit patchy, we'll need the funding to support the internet connectivity, tech and capacity and continuous capacity building of our activities. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you very much. Next, we have open post publication peer review from Victor Venema. Hello, my name is Victor Venema. Hope everyone can hear me. Um, I am working on open post publication peer review system, which I call grassroots review journals. Next slide. Um, so the main idea of this is to break the power of the publishers and their power stems, I think, from how the impact factor of the journals where you publish impact scientific careers. So we do not only need to review preprints, which is the topic today, but we really also need to review everything. So also the articles. Um, it is also not enough just to have a overlay journal um, because like in the normal review system, we need those different uh, quality levels. So you would at least need multiple overlay journals. My solution is to simply make a quantitative quality assessment um, so that multiple quality levels can be in one, one review journal. Um, to make sure that people are willing to do this work, uh, in the beginning it will be more work. I think it would help scientific community because these reviews are more informative. Because they are pub post-publication, they are up to date and they are made at the moment when a study is better understood. Also the open peer review records help a reader understand um, the, the, the reviews, um, so that makes the review more valuable. Um, what also helps in, I hope, in enticing people to participate is that it's not just about reviewing, but it's about building communities, also having community, um, communication tools for those communities, uh, information on conferences, all those kind of things. And, and if you in this way separate the post-publication quality assessment from the pre-publication peer review, it really, the pre-publication peer review becomes simply friendly feedback. Uh, next slide. Um, so this peer review system, I already made a relatively simple version, simply as a basically as a blog post um, on, on the homepage grassroots. Oh, Victor, we couldn't hear you for the last couple of seconds. Can you hear us? I think you're not muted, but the audio seems to be cut out. Yeah. Um, okay, so we can uh, offer to come back later. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perhaps I can also write to him directly. That would be great. Uh, maybe we can return uh, at yeah. the end of the session. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next we have uh, a presentation from pre-review, transforming peer review uh, through mentorship and community engagement. Thanks, Jessica. So first I want to share how excited we are to be part of this sprint and thank ASAP Bio for bringing us all together to collaborate. Uh, so pre-review is an open project aimed at diversifying the pool of peer reviewers. We train, empower, and support early career researchers in their journey to becoming constructive peer reviewers using an approach that centers equity, openness, and collaboration. From day one, we've shared out ideas openly so that we can contribute, even in a small way, to a greater good, that being the accessibility of scientific research and who gets to play a part in its evaluation. Uh, next slide. Um, so far, we have invested in building technical infrastructure to support and incentivize preprint review, but we know that technology alone does not address the bigger issue of community engagement. 
In other words, we need to invest in community infrastructure. To address this, we have developed two open projects. One, our Open Reviewers Program, which provides peer review training and gives an overview of how systems of oppression manifest in the peer review process. And two, our live stream preprint journal clubs, which encourage collaborative and globally accessible discussions around preprints. Our platform provides a home for the outputs of these programs. Next slide. There are many barriers to diversifying the peer review pool, including a lack of opportunities for peer review and equity training, support and acknowledgement, and also a lack of connection between new reviewers and editors on a level that builds trust. Through mentorship and community engagement, we propose two new ways to address these barriers. Uh, for the Open Reviewers Program, we propose to develop adaptable resources to support the running of globally inclusive and race, racially diverse cohort-based programs that train and connect reviewers with editors. We also propose to develop adaptable resources to help groups facilitate their own live stream preprint journal clubs in a way that encourages inclusive design and participation. Although our aim is to revolutionize how we discuss science and who is acknowledged as an expert, we recognize that there is also the risk of reproducing the same biases and oppressive structures that we see in scholarly publishing and the society at large. Help us make sure we don't reproduce these same inequalities that have dominated scholarship for centuries in the name of openness. Next slide. We have lots of questions and I'm sure there are many more that you can help us explore. So we hope that you'll join us in breakout session C, room two, so that we can work together to transform the peer review process in a way that works for us all. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, next we have Infold Research from Dragon Okanovic. Hello everyone, uh, thank, thanks for organizing, for organizing this. Okay, next slide. So basically to understand the problem, uh, we need to see what needs to happen to incentivize people to achieve the goals that we want. And uh, for example, progress in science. And so we need to define what the goals are. So we probably we need, need to define some kind of uh, metrics uh, that they will be optimizing for. And uh, we need to also provide some kind of motivation for them to really invest their time and effort into that and probably we will um, use the money to incentivize them because uh, it's the most common and most universal uh, way to as a most universal reward and there's nothing wrong with it and so when we take a look at the current status of academia and we see the metrics such as age index uh, we basically very quickly come to a conclusion that uh, some of the worst habits and practices in academia uh, stem from the way those metrics are defined and used and abused and uh, we are proposing to actually uh, create a new set of metrics. And so for that, we are building a community-driven publishing platform with points-based mechanics where all the content can be uh, voted on. And so it can be upvoted and downvoted. And basically the authors of that content will either earn or lose points based on that. And with more comprehensive and more detailed metrics such as that, that should really incentivize the collaboration uh, and uh, just knowledge sharing. Uh, and also with uh, votes mechanics, uh, the curation is enabled by default uh, because you can simply uh, filter and rank the content based on the points. And we actually think that uh, with more comprehensive and detailed metrics such as that, uh, we'll be able to, oh, sorry, next slide, uh, we'll be able to uh, also distribute the resources more fairly and uh, to streamline the entire process. And uh, next slide. Uh, and so the project is uh, currently ongoing and uh, it's uh, building a core platform with other tools and services uh, upcoming later. And uh, we're in need of funding uh, to actually hire people to achieve a certain status of uh, self-sustainability. And we have a very solid uh, business strategy how to expand and acquire users and uh, just stop this project from failing by default. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have the next project, which is CrowdPeer, and the presenter is Louis Fisher. Hi, everyone. My, my name is Louis. I'm the co founder of CrowdPeer. Yeah, next slide, please. CrowdPeer is a, a platform for the open review of preprints. And this is open in the sense that anyone from the wider community can contribute. The identities of reviewers that remain open, and the comments made are open. Briefly, what we do is we index papers from existing preprint servers. And then on the Crowdplayer platform, we have a purpose-built environment for commentary. 
where reviewers can engage with each other and use a voting system to highlight the most important contributions that are made. Uh, we recognize that preprint review needs to be a, a two-way street, so our final step is to extract value from the comments made, firstly for the authors in the terms of feedback, uh, for reviewers by using the voting system to allow them to build a reputation, and then for the preprint ecosystem, the comments can be used to provide a filter of preprint quality. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we think this will improve preprint review and curation? Firstly, by opening the review to the crowds, we increase the breadth of potential reviewers to academics at any stage of their career and from whatever region. Secondly, uh, the platform revolves around uh, individual comments, broadly categorized into four sections, covering all the traditional aspects of, of review. But you don't have to leave a full review, you could simply highlight a strength or a minor issue you see in the research. And you can review what you can and you review what you know. Thirdly, the, the platform is built on collaboration. So we encourage reviewers to interact with each other's contributions and provide the upvoting for you to indicate others' contributions, which you deem important to the community. And having made the contributions, we want to re reward reviewers for their work. We allow reviewers to build a reputation off of the upvoting system, and we want you to use this to further your career. Finally, as a result of having the comments available to the whole community, we can foster an environment where both experienced and inexperienced reviewers can come together to learn from each other. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with respect to what we need to make this a success, there's three areas we're currently looking into. Um, firstly, we think the platform provides a great space for the running of journal clubs. So if you take part in journal clubs or run journal clubs, we'd love to help you out. Uh, secondly, we're interested in working directly with preprint servers to link comments uh, on our site with listings on theirs, and this uh, makes them inherently more useful. And finally, we want to really explore how we can use this for education around peer review um, and critical appraisal. So if you're an educator, we'd love to chat to you about that. Uh, that's all for now. Thank you. Thanks. I'm hearing from BIMS that um, the Zoom is not uh, Zoom is not working, so we'll skip to the next one. So next we have putting peers at the heart of peer review coming from Angela Anderson and Life Science Editors. Thanks everyone. Um, I can't see the slides, so if you could advance to slide 44, that'd be great. Uh, so we're LSE, we're a team of former journal editors who've collectively managed thousands of peer reviews for journals like Cell Science and PLOS Biology. And we're proposing author initiated peer review for preprints. So when authors submit their preprint, they can initiate peer review by nominating a liaison team, the lab that will oversee the process. The liaison team invites multiple scientists or labs as reviewers. Reviewers then complete a structured review template and rate the preprint. The liaison team would then summarize the reviews, give an overall rating, and link their summary and the reviews to the preprint. This approach generates a high value product with three components, a peer reviewed preprint with a rating, structured reviews, and a peer review summary. And optional extras include that authors can respond to comments and revise their preprint, authors can rate the liaison team and reviewers, and readers can also rate the preprint liaison team and reviewers. Next slide. So peer review at journals is mostly behind closed doors, which reduces its visibility, diminishes trust, and divides communities. Our proposal unites scientists behind an open peer review to demonstrate and increase its value. What are the incentives? First, valuable products for all participants. A highlighted peer review preprint is valuable to authors. They get expert feedback from peers and can improve their work prior to journal submission. Their work will also be more visible, more credible to colleagues and hiring committees, study sections, and the media. Citable summaries and reviews are valuable for the liaison team and reviewers, and they can add citations and ratings to their CVs to demonstrate collegiality and high, highly visible peer review is likely to engage reader participation. The second incentive is a rewarding process. Having structured reviews and teams promotes higher quality reviews, reduces workload and minimizes bias. The process accelerates progress, not only in science, but how we evaluate science. And it creates an opportunity to train diverse scientists, including postdocs and students to become reviewers and editors. This could feed into journals and funding agencies. A third incentive, invitations develop communities and networks and create an opportunity to expand and diversify the liaison and reviewer pool. Next slide. 
So what do we need? We need the scientific community to be on board. So we should get input from them. Preprint servers need to be on board to integrate the summaries, reviews, and ratings with the preprints. We need a peer review template and protocol and a platform to manage peer review. We need the capacity to cite and rate preprints and reviews. And there should be beta testing to identify pitfalls and refine approaches. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next, we have piloting peer review overlay services on distributed network of preprint servers and repository. And the presenter is Martin Klein. Yeah, hi, my name is Martin. And together with my colleagues, Kathleen and Paul, I'd like to talk about our proposal piloting peer review overlay services on a distributed network of preprint servers and repositories. Next slide, please. So with our idea, we are enabling a common and standards compliant technical approach to the peer review process for preprints. The model is based on widely adopted standard web protocols, such as linked data notifications and activity streams for the communication of events related to the peer review process. The model is further platform and service agnostic, meaning it operates on the web and is therefore not dependent on specific implementations of publishing or reviewing services. In addition, it builds on a distributed network of, for example, uh, preprint servers and peer review service providers. Next slide, please. So we believe that our plan of action has the potential to really significantly increase levels of peer review and curation. Uh, as that, uh, we argue that our model operates at scale, meaning all uh, standard compliant parties can partake. And as we know, adoption of standards leads to increased levels of interoperability, which in turn leads to scale. Uh, if we further lower barriers of adoption and participation exactly because we are adopting standards, and we further help increase sustainability by decreasing dependencies between services. For example, even if a preprint service might be unavailable, its corresponding reviews might still be accessible at an independent service provider thanks to the distributed infrastructure. We also support use cases that may go beyond the traditional peer review, for example, scenarios where a third party requests a peer review, or where maybe even a less formal review, such as an authenticity check, for example, is requested. Next slide, please. So going forward, in order to be successful, we will continue to work with existing players in the landscape, such as preprint, repository, and peer review services and communities. So we're basically building on existing infrastructure and services rather than having to develop new ones. Though, of course, for the sake of scale, we would love to see growth in this space. We will refine workflows and uh, define taxonomies to support, support community source use cases that we have previously documented. And lastly, we will implement our proposed technologies into existing services. Though we have created a, a pilot as a proof of concept to basically convince ourselves this can work, we need to elevate this to the next level for broad adoption. So we are very excited uh, about the opportunity to uh, present our ideas here. And we're looking forward to the breakout session for further discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we have encouraging preprint review, making it easier to create reviews, making it easier to incorporate reviews from Nokome Bentley. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nokome Bentley. And along with Alexander, from, um, I'm from Stencilla. And we're going to be talking about uh, ideas to um, incorporate reviews into Stencilla. Next slide. So what is Stencilla? Um, Stencilla is a platform for executable documents and that includes executable preprints. So what are executable preprints? Um, they're preprints that involve embedded code, links to data and have outputs such as data visualizations and tables that are derived from that data. Um, and so an important part of what we're doing in Stencilla is taking that special type of document, which involves not only code, but also the narrative around that and turning them into publications. Um, and we wanna support authors that are using a variety of different formats, um, including not only Jupyter Notebooks and our Markdown that people are familiar with, but also um, documents like Google Docs and Word. Um, which are also really good for just writing prose and collaborating. So our idea for this sprint is to um, allow reviewers to work in those same platforms that the executable preprints are being written in. So we want reviewers to be able to make their comments and reviews in situ. Um, we already know that there's great platforms like that um, for commenting on documents like Google Docs, but also GitHub for commenting on code. And so the idea here is, can we take um, those platforms and extract reviews out of them 
just to reduce the friction and the barriers um, for people to write reviews. Next slide. So um, how, how will this help? Well, we wanna make it generally easier for authors to create executable preprints. Um, and as part of this process, we wanna make it easier for them to incorporate the review suggestions um, by, for instance, in a Google Doc, just saying, yes, I accept these changes or responding to review comments in situ. Um, and then to be able to create new versions based on those reviews. And at the same time, to make it easier for reviewers to create those reviews, um, to be able to just jump in a document and be able to comment directly on the content of that. And then we want to be able to take those reviews and take them from the informal setting of a Google Doc to a more formal um, display and minting of those, both the preprints and um, the reviews, minting DOIs for each of them, which then makes them available to the network um, via Crossref and, and other organisations like Unpaywall. Next. So how we how can you help in this process? So we're really getting on board with the idea of this being a sprint. Um, and so we're going to try over the next two weeks um, and report back to you uh, in early December on progress. So we're setting up, a, we've set up a development project uh, where we've got a number of open issues and PRs um, where we're working on some of the ideas here. So we'd love people to come along and comment and give us their ideas. Um, and also, if you want to contribute um, code and documentation, that'd be awesome. Um, but also, we'd love to get people's testing and feedback. Um, in a week or two, we should have hopefully have this in a state where people can try this out and see whether it actually works. So um, sign up to the Stencil Hub and let us know that you're interested in testing this out. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. And I have, have oops, sorry, didn't hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll just open to the next presentation from Daniela. Uh, so this is COVID-19 Rapid Review, a joint publisher's initiative to engage the community in the review of COVID-19 preprints. Thank you, Victoria, and thanks to the SRBio team and all the sponsors for making this sprint uh, happen. It's quite uh, exciting uh, to hear all these projects um, coming uh, after the review of preprints, which is um, super important, especially uh, as uh, everybody seems to have uh, realized um, uh, even more with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I am the project director and um, co-founder of Pre-Review, and Pre-Review is uh, one of the organizations that joined in last spring and a group of um, scientific, technological, and medical publishing organization. Uh, they all came together with um, a request to uh, the research community to um, uh, rapidly review COVID-19 manuscripts and share those uh, reviews across a group of uh, joint uh, publishers. Uh, as um, the uh, only representative of uh, preprint reviews in this group, we have been uh, uh, working, can you please go to the next slide, um, with uh, the preparing working group part of this initiative to uh, train and support the engagement of uh, more than 1,700 researchers uh, who in the first two weeks signed up to uh, help with this initiative and uh, particularly directing their uh, efforts to the review of preprints, uh, COVID-19 related preprints on Outbreak Science Rapid Pre Review, which is an open platform that uh, we uh, jointly uh, with Open uh, Outbreak Science launched uh, last uh, January. Um, uh, kind of a predicting <laughs> a possible outbreak, but not quite a pandemic. Um, and so what we are uh, trying to do here is to um, engage these already um, uh, uh, researchers who already volunteer their time into the review of preprint and uh, kind of um, getting to the uh, questions of the incentives and, and uh, training and community engagement. Uh, with uh, an approach that I'm going to tell you in a minute. Um, but the, the other important part of what we want to do here is to create a path um, uh, that uh, merges the workflow uh, between the uh, community reviews and the peer review, um, the general organized peer review, so that the community reviews could be uh, used and in support um, of the peer review process and to speed it up. Um, next slide, please. 
um, in order to engage a community um, of uh, volunteer rapid reviewers, as we call uh, them, we want to use this opportunity of the sprint to uh, implement a community a community engagement strategy and harness some of these um, uh, work that we're doing a pre review with uh, training and uh, live stream preprintional clubs to really uh, engage uh, the community into a more participatory way of doing reviews. Um, and also um, work with uh, our user research, user research team to better understand what are the needs of editorial teams in terms of like what, how can we make these reviews uh, quickly accessible to them for uh, the, um, uh, the, the quick vetting at editorial level. Um, and we want to build on a current dashboard that we just prototyped this summer um, and our API to automate um, and streamline this uh, workflow. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the dashboard and we invite you all to uh, come and, and we're really looking for ideas and technical skills uh, that can um, help uh, this, with this integration as well as, as well as beta testers and endorsement from uh, other group. So join us in uh, period A, room six. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Daniela. Next, we have leveraging smart citations as preprint commentary and review. Hi, everyone. From Josh Nichols. Uh, so so um, I'm excited to propose uh, something that maybe sounds a, a bit different from other projects, and that is using citations as a form of review. So prior to founding Cite, I actually launched a company called The Winnower, which was specifically focused on open post-publication peer review of preprints. Uh, and what I learned from that is it's exceedingly difficult to get people to review things uh, without harassing them effectively, and it's exceedingly difficult to get them to do it openly. Um, what we found from that is if you kind of brand reviews as papers in themselves, because that is a currency of scientists, that can help. Uh, and so I'm proposing using citations and preprints and all these reviews that everyone is, is uh, discussing and publishing uh, as a form of review itself. Can you go to the next one? So what we do at Cite is, is not just similar to Web of Science or Dimensions or other citation indices. We are advancing citations so you can see how a, a paper or a preprint has been cited and specifically if it's been supported or disputed. So you can see the conversation amongst papers and quickly read what is this preprint, what is this paper saying about this article of interest. Uh, and we would like to bring this not only to, to articles but also to preprints themselves. Uh, and so we would like to embed this effectively in, in preprint platforms themselves uh, and to work with others in the community to ingest their reviews uh, as, as a centralized source. You go to the next one. The good thing about this is that we've already done this and we have a lot of signals uh, already. Uh, and so if you look at our information on bio archive and med archive, we already have 250,000 uh, citation statements from thousands of preprints. Uh, we've learned that preprints are literally talking to each other within five days uh, of each other. So this citation lag, which may sound you know, quite long in preprints is, is uh, becoming quite quick. Um, and it's, it's really a powerful way to look at preprints to see this one's been supported by another preprint and you can go read the full preprint. So it's not just this small snippet, but it can open up to a, a broader ex, uh, expanse. Um, but I think, you know, in order to, to get this information, it needs to be adopted into people's workflows and, and posted in different areas. And so we're really looking to, to embed this information within the preprint system. And then again, to, to work with uh, different groups here uh, to ingest their reviews so that it's displayed there. And so next. Um, so if you want, uh, our badge is freely available. You can go to site.ai slash badge. Uh, it's a little snippet of, of text and you can embed that. Uh, if you would like your information to be included uh, in our system, please reach out to me and we can discuss. It effectively does need to have a DOI for us in order to process it, but that's really kind of the, the only uh, limitation that we have here. Uh, so looking forward to the, the breakout room for, for more feedback. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. So next we have take a penny, leave a penny, and status as credit. And we have the team from Research, uh, Research Square to present. Hi, sorry, I didn't put my name there. I'm Michelle Avasar Whiting, Editor-in-Chief at Research Square. Uh, so this might be the most idealistic, maybe naive proposal, um, but fundamentally it might also be among the simplest. Um, so you can go to the next slide. The basic premise is uh, that there can emerge an expectation um, that a preprint deposited in a preprint in a preprint server is a preprint reviewed, because posting a preprint is free and fast and clearly benefit to authors, and most of them are hoping for some sort of engagement or feedback when they do that. So it only makes sense that um, 
they should provide that for somebody else. And so if we make this process easy and intuitive and normalize that pay it forward spirit as part of the culture, um, it could work. And this would involve messaging at the point of submission, encouraging authors to conduct a review on a preprint in their field that is not currently under review at a journal um, and someone who has specifically indicated interest in having their preprint reviewed and then optionally um, maybe accrued interest in their preprint from others um, to also have it reviewed. And the second part of this proposal um, is to establish a form of recognition for preprint review. This is similar to what a lot of other people have said already and would be similar to the Publons model, but in my opinion, will likely work better on the backdrop of um, open and transparent reviews on preprints. You can go to the next slide. So people who um, either loudly or tacitly support the shift toward, um, among other things, post-publication review should be early adopters of a system like this um, and give it the energy and momentum that it needs. Really, this is just about casting a more targeted net rather than casting a wider net uh, for reviewers. So this should be framed as an opportunity to get on board with um, what I think a lot of people consider to be an important and long overdue movement. You can go to the next slide. At minimum, um, this project will require some collaboration among preprint servers uh, and the involvement of an organization that has already established a system for preprint review. Um, realistically, and certainly in order to fulfill the second part of the proposal, um, it'll also require project management, design, and engineering. That's it for me. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have the 2019 novel coronavirus research compendium uh, and presented by Kate and Emily. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Kate Grabowski. And as Victoria mentioned, I'm going to be presenting on the novel coronavirus research compendium or NCRC for short, uh, which is an ongoing established uh, project. Next slide. Okay, so I, I think as, as others have pointed out here, as the pandemic and has unfolded, there's really been this rapid proliferation of literature on COVID-19, and a lot of it has been released as preprint. Uh, many of the studies that have either been published as preprint or have been published in peer-reviewed journals um, are not necessarily of the highest quality. And so, um, so we're public health people and epidemiologists, uh, and, and we've been working on the response and what we've been hearing from key stakeholders, government officials, uh, people working in public health institutions, um, including the Baltimore City Health Department, was that they just had a really hard time parsing out what the best and uh, most novel information was uh, from all of this emerging literature. And so what we had been asked to do uh, by many of these stakeholders was to curate uh, what they thought was the most exciting uh, and, and impactful research in, um, um, happening in COVID-19. And so what we did was we um, functionally formed a centralized publicly available resource uh, that rapidly curates and reviews emerging scientific information about COVID-19. Um, and our goal um, and our real target audience here is to provide accurate and relevant information for global public health action by clinicians, uh, public health practitioners, and policymakers. So a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the other um, proposals here are really focused on the academic community, while we're really focused on these key public health stakeholders. Um, so our team includes more than 60 uh, Johns Hopkins faculty, students, and postdoctoral fellows. We've also been able to rope in um, colleagues from other universities, including Vanderbilt, Boston University, and Imperial College London. Next slide. Um, so, so how does this all work? So we worked with some um, uh, informationists at the Welsh uh, Library here at Johns Hopkins University to create custom searches in eight topic areas of public health relevance. These eight topic areas were then automated across uh, PubMed and uh, various preprint servers. And then the output is routinely downloaded into a custom web application that was developed just for the NCRC for review. So we manage all of our workflow in this custom web application. Um, once all those articles are loaded into the application, we curate them. So we find what's the most new and exciting stuff. Um, and we specifically prioritize high quality original research for public health action. We will also cover papers receiving significant press uh, for review regardless of their quality. 
Um, then for each paper that actually gets selected into the compendium, uh, we do a review. Um, we review um, just the basic information, the setting, the study population, um, some of the key methods, the results, the strengths and the limitations. And we do a final take on each of those articles where we give our bottom line about what we think about it. Um, and then after all of that, uh, the re summary reviews undergo a scientific editing process before they're posted to the website. And then our reviews, um, uh, if they're preprints on MedArchive and BioArchive are actually linked to those uh, preprint servers. So we've been working with um, the folks there to, to make sure our, our links are directly uploaded. Um, we also have a weekly newsletter that provides subscribers with updates on the latest reviews that we have been doing. Next slide. So um, there's been a lot of challenges with these peer review efforts. Um, many people have mentioned the same uh, challenges in their talks, so that's uh, refreshing, but also disconcerting to hear at the same time. Um, one of our main challenges has really been reaching our target audience, letting people know that this resource is out there and that they can use it. Um, the people who we're trying to reach are very busy individuals. Um, the web application we developed in the beginning was not necessarily meant to handle all of the different um, folks that we have working on this project. Um, as I mentioned, we have a large number of users. Um, and the back end database is really insufficient to keep, keep up with a massive amount of research output that's been coming um, into uh, the preprint and uh, PubMed servers. Um, as many have mentioned, I think sustainability and motivation of our reviewers is a, is a major issue. Um, currently, all of our faculty effort is volunteered. I mean, it's very mission focused, but I think eventually that uh, mission focus will fade as this pandemic continues to wane on. Um, we do have student reviewers and we do pay them, but um, our money and funding is running out. Um, that said, I think um, this has actually been a very successful effort. Um, this is one of the few um, high quality curation and review efforts on COVID-19 out there. And our reviews um, are specifically targeted and accessible for those in, um, you know, working in, in public health practice, so not necessarily academics per se. Uh, so um, thank you very much. And uh, if you're interested in chatting more, please join us um, in breakout room five. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear about periodicals from Boris Barber. Okay, hello everyone. So, um, pleased to be here. Uh, so, I'm representing the PubPeer Foundation and we house the PubPeer website that I guess uh, some, if not most of you know about, which is now eight years old. Um, but I'm here to pitch a sister website uh, that you may know less about periodicals, and we're not asking for money. I just wanted to take the opportunity to pitch the site to a receptive audience, uh, both as um, consumers or producers of content on the site, um, to offer the site as a platform for curation services, either in parallel just to increase exposure, publicity, or as an infrastructure for your service. It's designed for that and to share a few lessons learned because it already exists and we've been running it for a while. So the next slide, um, most of you here probably would tend to agree that uh, journals are intended to serve the functions of selection, validation and dissemination, but have maybe gone off the rails a little bit in achieving those uh, goals. And in parallel, the original argument of dissemination has now been totally disrupted by the internet. So if we, some of us think that journals aren't doing the best job they could, why don't you do better? So periodicals is a platform that allows you to do that, to experiment with different editorial policies and to showcase your own expertise. So next slide, it's, uh, uh, you can visit it at this site. It's designed as a flexible platform for any sort of overlay or virtual journal. You can curate your individual reading list or you can set up an editorial board, solicit review. Um, you select validate papers. There's no actual publication. What you do is you select existing publications. It's 100% preprint compatible, but it works with all publications. They can be old, new, proven, forgotten, uh, hot new things. 
Useful content is mirrored on papier. And an excellent example of an individual periodical is Theoretical Neuroscience by Romain Brett. And I'll try and finish not too late. Next slide. Uh, it's been running since summer 2018. The lessons learned, Josh has already mentioned. It's very hard, very difficult. Uh, it's hard work to produce high quality reviews. Uh, building up an audience is difficult. So what we're interested in is publicity and engagement. And I just want to reiterate that periodicals can be adapted to support most curation pro uh, projects. And we'd be very interested to speak to anybody interested in that aspect. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Boris. Uh, we have a second proposal from Tomas Lemberger, which is towards principled metrics of scientific influence with automa uh, automatic curation and preprint. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, so in the first project, we were talking about the peer review process, so the human-based evaluation of preprints. And in that project, we tried to see the complementary aspect to see um, uh, to propose a, a curation, a machine-based curation process uh, of, of, of preprints that would be complementary. <coughs> Next uh, slide. So when talking about curation, especially how curation is done at, at the journals, I'm, I'm myself an, an editor, one of the, of the goals of, of uh, preprint curation and, and manuscript curation uh, is to filter a large amount of content um, to try to select for, for relevance by selecting for a number of dimensions, typically conceptual novelty, uh, significance of the findings, whether the findings are important, uh, surprising, the depth of, of the analyses and, and such features. And there has have been a, a lot of progresses in terms of automatic analysis of natural language uh, with, with AI. And it seems that the, the time is ripe to attempt to derive metrics that are really concentrated on the scientific content of, the, of a preprint, not the citation networks or not the, the, the social network activity, but really on the, on the scientific content and derive metrics that would uh, be helpful for such an automatic uh, uh, automatic curation. And ideally, these metrics should be explainable on, on based on, on some principles that define what is novelty in that context, um, rather than resulting from a black box uh, approach like uh, uh, by fitting through machine learning. Next uh, slide. So with the, the early evidence based, again, we, we, are, we are playing with the, these ideas. We used a, an artificial intelligence platform that we have trained on, on with a, a project called Source Data uh, that is able to extract hypotheses that are tested and reported in the figures of the, of the preprints. So we can run this engine on, on preprints and build a, a knowledge graph based on these hypotheses and that is, uh, and this knowledge graph is really linked to the to the experimental evidence that are presented in the in the um, in the preprint. So really linked to the scientific content, and from that knowledge graph, derive metrics then that prioritize interesting content. Uh, we are very uh, at the very beginning of, of this approach, but it seems to be to be promising to reach some metrics that allow us to to enrich uh, for novel or interesting or preprints that bridge different fields. So what does it bring? It, it brings a, a fast curation that can be applied at scale, um, focused on the scientific content, and therefore highly complementary with the human-based uh, peer review process. And last slide, uh, what we, we are looking is a, an interdisciplinary uh, group. The, the, the next slide, if you manage to want to pass, um, is a, a multidisciplinary team that combines two worlds that usually do not talk to each other. One team is, is one, one world is the, the world of data scientists and artificial intelligence engineers. And the other world is the, the world of, of editorial curators and, and, and editors who, who are well trained to select uh, uh, for interesting content. And we would like to bring these two groups together to to derive such uh, such methods. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And next we have preprint review and curation by content type with Daniel Mitchin. Okay, I see you have an old version of the slides. Can you reload the, sli uh, the page? Um, because I just, um, I fiddled with it until a few seconds ago. 
yeah, here we go. It's much more colorful now. So the basic idea is preprints are a lot of things. They're not just a, a blob of text. They might contain data code or pointers to data or code protocols, computational models, ethics, and so on. Next slide, please. So um, what I want to uh, propose is that we clarify how the different kinds of materials are to be um, reviewed. Then we use different methods of annotating the different components so that they can be more easily identified and uh, then actually subjected to type specific review, that we build tools that support uh, the process and that we signal to what extent a given preprint or even the review of it meets certain standards for the review of such uh, materials. Next slide. Um, so how would this work in practice? So we would start by looking at a corpus of preprints. Some other people who have spoken before me have already done this to some extent. Um, here, the focus would be to analyze what kind of content types uh, come with those preprints. Then we would look at what are best practices and best practice examples for the review of these kinds of materials. We would distill those into best practice recommendations. And the important point here would be to complement what uh, Thomas just said, that it's not just uh, for humans, but also for machines so that the machines can actually assist with this process. Um, there are lots of guidances, but there are just essentially other blobs of text. They're not very actionable. So we would distill those recommendations into validation tools, batch systems, and a dashboard that would show progress. And then of course we would test and document all of this so that we can improve step-by-step. Step. Next slide. Um, here, the next slide, please. Yeah, here are just some examples of how we are annotating things already. So uh, on this is three columns, basically on the left-hand column, uh, this is the landing page for a paper. This uh, might send you to the different sections of um, metadata about it. Um, in the middle column, you have a preprint that's available in XML. Some of the XML is actually annotating certain kinds of things. So like a GenBank identifier here. Lots of other things that could be annotated have not been annotated, but that's maybe something that um, machines, machine learning could help with, or we could actually have tools that facilitate that. On the right-hand side, uh, you have uh, basically some clustering that is performed by a search engine. And in the top right, I was just putting in the citation ontology because yes, uh, citations are another way of annotating things. And you, uh, since you can cite not only papers, but also data sets, software, and other things, um, so that's these are just some illustrations of how we can annotate existing types. Next slide. Um, so how will this help? It will improve documentation. It will do, make the documentation more actionable. It will enable machines to do the automatable stuff. Um, it will also assist with matching the content with uh, human reviewers and vice versa. And this is in contrast to current review practices. When I receive a review request, it typically disrupts my workflows. And uh, when I'm searching for something where, uh, that I actually need for my research, I'm very happy to review those things. And right now the matching is really, really bad. And so this kind of activity would help make the match better. And also we would signal more of the, uh, what the current practice is. We would make this more visible and more adapted to the different kinds of content. And uh, of course, changes over time, over time could be visualized. Next slide. Yeah, so what we need is technological development in terms of the validation tools. Um, so think of it as a tool that, uh, to which is said, or, or the metadata about it or something, and it will tell you to what extent that fits with certain um, recommendations, best practices. And then uh, you could get actually badges for this. Those badges, badge systems need to be developed, they need to be tested, and they need to be adapted to uh, the content types to maybe the communities, the journals and the preprint platforms and so on. Um, for that, we need also collaborative uh, feedback testing. We need endorsements from communities that would be interested in this kind of thing. And I could see interactions with lots of the others that are presenting here today. And of course, yes, uh, this uh, would require funding. And 
I must say, I don't have this as a project sculpted out, but I see the need for it and I'm happy to participate or join forces with anyone else who is interested in walking in this direction. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Tomas uh, Crucial fr from BIMS. So we hope this works uh, with the audio. Unfortunately, I'm not able to hear uh, yeah. Thomas, but maybe I can just, um, uh, Thomas, if you want to try getting this uh, worked out or jumped in, um, and maybe we can just present the slides <laughs> on your behalf briefly. Uh, hopefully, this is uh, my first time doing uh, unwilling <laughs> karaoke, but um, Biomed News uh, is a project uh, that um, I'll just perhaps read the slides for somebody who might not have access to seeing them. Um, to understand Biomed News in relation to preprints, we need to get back to old. Since the later part of the 20th, 20th century, math and physics had preprints. Uh, computer science and economics had working papers. Computer science working papers have died. Um, economic working papers are alive, uh, thanks to REPEC. Um, a key part of REPEC is NEP, New Economics Papers, where uh, since 1998, I have volunteers classifying working papers into subject-specific reports. Um, in that way, working papers reach readers. Such a system could be of use to help the emerging life science preprints. As uh, as soon as I uh, found a project director, I created a clone of NEP called BIMS. Since 2017, volunteers select and optionally rank incoming papers. Since there are a few preprints, we use all of PubMed. In 2020, uh, PubMed uh, started to index some preprints, so we cover those. Since uh, being new is a prime advantage of preprints, a system that brings, apologies, I have many overlapping windows on top of my Zoom, so I'm just moving them all around. A system that brings new papers to readers will increase the compare, uh, comparative advantage of preprints. It's really the idea that bio, we do it. In the rep expert, we export all our data. We hope BIMS can be an independent part and a federated set of services that will enable scholarly communication reform. Aggregate ranking can provide a crowdsourced form of peer review mark. Uh, we have all skills bar marketing. We need collaborations. Uh, sorry, I'm moving my <laughs> slides more than anything. Our main stumbling block is our disadvantaged background. Uh, I am a complete outsider. We have no institutional backing, let alone funding. Our approach is humble, conservative, cheap, and extremely unusual. We are literally incredible. <laughs> that makes finding collaborators hard. Having an institution sponsor a server is the most pressing need. At this point, then we'll start disseminating via email. Technical work on our infrastructure would help. There are serious technical challenges behind what looks like a 20th century website. All right. Okay, great. Uh, so um, so now we move back to uh, uh, the next project, which is preprint metadata and sub-metadata surfacing. And we have uh, Tomas uh, from PCI. Thank you very much. So we are indeed from PCI, but we are not going to present you peer community in PCI because uh, it's another service that is not completely linked to this print design. Although, although PCI is a, a reviewing service of, for preprints and also a recommendation uh, service for preprints, it means uh, an endorsement service. So I'm not going to speak about PCI. So the, the idea is that we think that reviews and endorsements of preprints are not visible enough. And uh, so that, uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, we lack, uh, we miss uh, people wanting to make endorsements and reviews. So we need a general way to link the preprints to review, to reviews and to endorsements. And uh, a way to do that is to uh, propose a system of badges that will uh, summarize the history of peer review and endorsement for each uh, preprint. So for instance, the badge could be present in HTML pages of, uh, of web pages, uh, for instance, in, uh, in search results of a very well-known uh, search engine. The badge can also uh, be put uh, in an automatized way uh, and securitized way on the preprint itself. So for instance, in the PDF or the EPUB file. So this is what we see on the, on the right, where you can see the history of the peer reviews and the endorsements. And also uh, all this information should be incorporated in the metadata of the, of the preprint itself. And this metadata should include some sub metadata about the peer reviews and the endorsement. This is the idea. So 
uh, if you have peer reviews and endorsements, they will have their own DOI with their own metadata. And this metadata will be included as sub metadata into the DOI and the metadata of the article itself. This is basically the idea. And we also propose to make it very visible, uh, a new standard uh, for uh, referencing preprints. So for instance, there is an example on the bottom of this slide where there is a preprint uh, posted on BioArchive with the DOI of the preprint. The version three has been endorsed by somebody for peer community, for instance, and it's, uh, the endorsement is based on the reviews by uh, uh, somebody else and uh, et cetera. And so each time you cite the endorsement, the people who endorsed the endorsement service, the reviewer on which uh, the, the peer review, uh, the, the peer reviews on which the endorsement was made and the name of the peer reviewer. So it makes a long reference, but uh, there is no problem because we have some, some places in HTML pages. Uh, so next slide, please. So basically the idea is to, uh, to uh, make the journal and the reviewing services uh, publishing the peer reviews in open access with the GOI and with their own metadata. And the journals and other endorsement service should also mandatorily publish the endorsement statement in open access with DOI and metadata. And they should mention the reviews and the reviewers that served as the basis for each endorsement. And in this way, there will be a strong incentive for uh, the reviewers and the editors because they would have their name associated with the preprint as reviewer or as editor. And their name should be uh, in the reference of the preprint and then names would be associated with the endorsement itself. And for instance, they would have uh, their names included in the endorsement statement. So next slide, please. So basically what we need, uh, th there will be some technology development because we need interoperability between actors. We need also the development of uh, badges and we need the development of a dedicated securitized part of the article itself with the patch in the article. Uh, the goal of this proposal is just to obtain the agreement of uh, the main actors uh, around this, uh, this topic, the preprint servers, the journal, the DOI uh, issuers, etc. And all this is just an idea, okay? We do not request, request any funding. So we just want uh, the publication actors who are interested to work together and maybe uh, with our help also, also because we can share our thoughts with uh, big pleasure. So we do not request any funding and this is just to uh, share our ideas. So anybody interested can go and meet us in the, in the breakout uh, room after that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. I think that brings us back to grassroots journals since we had the technical issue earlier with Victor's audio. So we will jump, jump back into these slides. Exactly, let's see if it works this time. Um, so I already presented the first slide. Um, we can move to the next one. Here we just have to remember we, the aim is to break the power of the publishers. And for that, we need a quantitative quality assessment. Um, so the review page, the, the review of one article looks like this. So you can see it on the right. Um, it has title, citation, abstract, and categories to make the article and the review findable. Um, every review is made by multiple editors, one name, and they write a synthesis based upon all the reviews and the comments. Um, and that is a text and also a quantitative assessment of the scientific contribution that is being made. So how much do you contribute to science? The technical quality of the paper, which I would think is important for hiring people and contribution to society, which is I think for funders, quite important. Um, next to that, everyone can make comments. Everyone can add links to more information. They are pre-moderated by the editors. Um, yeah, and you can also make real pre preferreds uh, Normal people make quantitative peer reviews as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so what do we need? At the moment, um, I'm simply building a homepage where you can see how the system looks like. In the end, there should be a federated server, maybe multiple servers, all talking to each other. And the next stage would be 
I hope that there would be multiple impl implementations and all those different uh, review systems talk to each other uh, with a common exchange protocol for the peer review reports and, and the quantitative assessment and the assessment systems. Um, and then finally, it would become part of an ecosystem of open science services. Um, so what do we need? Um, we could either work on, on the prototype website that would need WordPress skills. I don't know how, how much that is available here, but if that is available, that would be really useful for me. Um, we of course need to build communities. It was already mentioned that that is also really a lot of work. If I look at all the contributions I have seen today, I have the feeling that many would be really helped by having such an exchange system for peer review reports and for maybe also for the grades. We have preprint service, which could then uh, list comments made elsewhere uh, where you could make comments, overlay journals, reviews could be distributed everywhere. It's got multiple post-publication peer review systems, and it would be great to uh, distribute all those different peer reviews. Um, and I think we could do that. Oh no. <laughs> okay. So this happened again, but um, I think it, uh, everyone can read from the, the sheet that um, that was what uh, Victor would need for feedback on the breakout session. So next, I want to just mention that um, for the break breakout session, since we're a little bit late due to all the technical issues, um, we will still have 20 uh, minutes per each session. So I'm just trying to add the um, updated time onto the sign up sheet. So we will begin in three minutes. So, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so in terms of logistics, there should be, uh, you should be able to screen share and the role of the moderator is to make sure that everybody stays on topic and that uh, everything is constructive. And next. So, and if you haven't received the sign up sheet already, I will share it again inside in the chat. I will share the link and it should look like this. So um, please see that there's a maximum number of participants per each room. So um, we hope that we'll be able to let everyone into a room uh, and distribute the number of participants evenly. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, meet in the breakout sessions. So the link is coming here in the chat. <laughs> 